Well, g'day curd nerds. Hopefully you can see me. Uh, welcome to another episode of Ask the Cheese Man. Um, just checking all things YouTube are good. It says the stream is healthy. Lovely. Excellent. Uh, we'll wait for a few more to come on board before we start. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, well, say some good mornings while we're waiting. A good morning to MJ, Leonardo, Hind, uh, Kep, hello to you, uh, Jordan, uh, Lisbeth, and Deep South Texas. Uh, who else? Lucas. Excellent. So excited for this round. I'm excited too. <laughs> Uh, Des, Mike, uh, Deville, uh, thank you, uh, Philip, hello, from London. All righty. Um, okay, let's start the show, might as well. Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Well, g'day, curd nerds. And I'm back. This is Ask the Cheese Man episode ooh, 46, where you can ask all of your cheese making questions. Uh, just a bit of admin before we start. Um, some of the, uh, sorry, my apologies for uh, the last video. I made two uh, agenda mistakes, unfortunately. So, Roz, we're talking about um, the do it yourself. Uh, cheese press video so Roz is not a lady it's a man I'm sorry Roz and uh, the person I pr pronounced as Stephanie was Stefan so that was a man as well so terribly sorry I apologize to both you men uh, for uh, changing your genders uh, within the video um, next week there won't be a show uh we're getting very very busy here on our um, e-commerce store at little green workshops um so uh, we will be taking the time to uh, to ship orders as they come in so we're going to fall a bit behind if we don't take that time um on the cheese making front uh i've just finished some uh queso fresco with sweet and cranberries very delightful lovely little cheese and there'll be a video out um, soon about that. I've also made queso chihuahua, uh, which is a Mexican cheese, uh, same as queso fresco. It's not the same sort of cheese. It's actually very similar to cheddar. So queso chihuahua, um, and uh, that'll be out uh, well, soon, hopefully. I don't know if it'll be before Christmas or after Christmas. Not too sure at the moment. And same on cell, which is a hard blue cheese. I've got that in the cheese cave at the moment. Uh, another video that's coming up. I've got the videos coming at my wazoo at the moment. Um, there'll be a taste test for the lactose-free kefili, uh, and that'll be happening um, soon as well. Uh, so that's ripening in the cheese cave. And don't forget that during the show, you can um, support it by super chatting, little icon down there, little dollar sign. Um, you can uh, send some... So Moolah My Way, that'll be fantastic. Keeps the show running um, every Wednesday morning, except when we can't, of course. Okay, so let's go through and start with some questions. Uh, oh, Kim's here. That's great. Um, just a couple more hellos. Adam, William, Ladybug Lover, uh, Otis. Uh, all right, so let's uh, start. Where's the first question? Um... Where is it? Uh, Jordan asks, what type of cheese do you recommend to make if you have like five hours or so? Um, well, quite a few of the cheeses that I make um, really only take about, well, five hours from milk to mould. That's the kind of timing. So that's the time where you need to concentrate um, to make your cheese. So in fact, queso fresco is a good one because it only took me three four hours i think from milk to mold and it's only got a 
six hour pressing time. Well, I actually cut it down this time and made it a little bit moister. Um, so a five hour pressing time in this case. Um, and it turned out fantastic and you could eat it straight away. So good thing about queso fresco, it's fresh cheese, right? Um, and I tend to press it a little bit more than um, what um, uh, traditionally it is in Mexico. But a very nice cheese. So there's there's two videos already on queso fresco. There's one with chilies and just one uh, plain one. So try those out, Jordan. Okay, next question is from uh, Ladybug Lover. Um, if you can make cheese with cow or goat's milk, can you make it with nut or soy milk? Well, technically, it's not called cheese. Um, you can. There's a. I got a. There's a vegan kit over there, and that just uses nuts. That uses cashews and I think it could be almonds. Um, so it's not technically cheese because cheese is only made with milk. Um, but yeah, they're called nut cheeses, and yes, you can. Uh, there are some um, coagulants and all that sort of stuff. Um, in the kit that you need to make the nuts turn into a, a sod from the, the milk mass. But yeah, you can you can do that. But you can't traditionally um, make cheese as in add rennet to nut milk. It just doesn't work. They're not the same thing. Okay, Otis says, hi. Oh, hello, Otis. Tiny dog cheese. Tiny dog cheese. No, don't get the reference, MJ. Um, Elizabeth, I cannot read portuguese sorry um okay uh if you've got a question can you do it in english pretty please um where we got um lucas says i have one question about adding liquid smoke to cheeses like howda and mozzarella what are your thoughts on this well funny you should say that i've done a video lucas uh and if kim's quick off the mark today um, she'll put a link to the um, smoked uh, chowder that I've done. Uh, it works. Um, it works quite well. And then there is a lovely smoky aroma and flavour to the cheese. So liquid smoke does work. Um, so it's a smoke flavoured cheese, not a smoked cheese, if we're going to be technical about it. Okay, Adam says, uh, wondering if Australia had any restrictions on importing raw milk cheeses. Um, it did up until a couple of years ago. So there's been a, a great, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, great rise in the um, the demand for raw milk cheeses out of, say, France and Italy. Um, we are starting to import them. And I think it's due to the work that uh, Will Stud, I don't know how many people are familiar with Will Stud, He's the guy that makes the TV show Cheese Slices, um, and he's an advocate for um, cheese making, raw milk cheese making here in Australia. Um, there are a few dairies that do it here, not a lot, but there are a few. Um, but yes, we're starting to see some raw milk cheeses in cheesemongers. Never, in, you'll never see them in supermarkets here. It's just too, it's not commonplace. Um, but yeah, we're getting some. Uh, Jeremy says, "I'm keen on making cheddar, and I've never made cheese." Can I start with that or can I start or, sh or should I start with simpler cheeses like mozzarella, paneer or bel paese? Um, there's no reason why you can't start with cheddar, Jeremy. Um, it's, oh, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, look, if it's the very first cheese you're going to make, you may have to do it a couple of times um, because you've got to get the techniques down pat. But uh, And doing simpler cheeses like paneer and bel paese would certainly work. Um, mozzarella is certainly not a beginner's cheese, uh, even as a quick cheese. Um, uh, so, look, you can start. I've seen people buy camembert kits and make them successfully the very first time. So, yeah, give uh, cheddar a go. It certainly won't hurt. I would highly recommend, though, that uh, you don't cloth band it the first time round. Um, I would uh, either wax or vacuum pack it if you've got those facilities. Uh, and uh, one of the kits we sell, the hard cheese kit, actually comes with all the gear you need. You just got to add milk. There's a recipe for cheddar there and stuff. And it comes with wax as well. Anyway, uh, Ron um, is from Ants. Now, hello, Ron. Um, Aussie Dan, man, just wondering 
what the sterile jar, jars are for with your cultures that you sell and how to use them. Um, Dan, what they're for, uh, you see some of the sachets that we send out for the cultures, you can't reseal them. Um, so the sterile jars that we send out, the, oops, excuse me, uh, like that. And they're just sample jars, but there's no samples in them, of course. Um, but yeah, you just pour your cult, all your culture straight in there and it's got a really good airtight lid and bung it in the freezer and a little label, you can even write what the culture is and um, put it in the freezer and it lasts for ages. It doesn't get uh, any moisture in it um, and they'll keep for um, up to 12 months after the best before date. I've certainly been using cultures that are out of date and having no issues with the cheese whatsoever. Anyway, um, Philip says, um, a cheese book that I read said that goat's milk has a closer taste to human milk. Um, has the thought ever entered your mind of trying it out? What, human milk? I think I did when I was a, a baby. Um, but I have certainly made cheeses with goat's milk, if that's your question, Philip. Okay. Oh, just missed a thousand questions here. Um, sorry, hang on. Um, Aussie Dan Man says, thanks for all you do. My first bail pay is with Verity this weekend. Well done, mate. Um, hi, I have a problem with ricotta. It does not work. Um, it depends on what type of whey you're using. If you're using a creamy, uh, whey, so a whey that has been, um, a whey that is the waste product from cheeses that are set with rennet, then you can make ricotta. But if you're making, uh, trying to make ricotta with a clear yellow, uh, transparent way, there is no way, pardon the pun, that you will make ricotta out of it. Okay. Um, Philip said, here's the real question. Um, how can I tell if a cheese is maturing before I try it? Is it cheese is matured? Um, there's a little device called a cheese trier, and it's like um, it's like a very sharp um, half moon knife that you plunge into the cheese, give it a twist, pull it out, taste a bit of the paste, pop it in and uh, reseal it, and uh, that's how you tell. If you've got one, they're quite expensive, um, unless you can get one secondhand. Um, but really, um, I tend to just go by the date. You know, after six months, cheddars are good. Um, most of the recipes are fairly accurate, um, even the ones that I give and the ones you read in books, like the ones behind me there. Um, yeah, look, they've all been tried and tested, so... Just go by those date. If you're unsure, just uh, add another month on and it'll, it'll only taste better, so, which is a good thing. Okay. Um, Deep South Texas says, is there a reason not to add calcium chloride um, while the milk is heating up before the culture is added? Same question for a natto. Um, no, there's not any reason. You can add calcium chloride at the start if you wish. You just need to add it before the rennet. Um now, with a natto, you also need to add the natto before, let me just think, you need to add the natto before you add the calcium chloride, of all things, because um, that's how it seems to work, all right. Um, yep, yeah, so the re I don't know what the reasoning is, but I do know that uh, you definitely have to add the calcium chloride before you add... Um, the rennet because you know you're adding it to um to help strengthen the curd okay mj chihuahua cheese well it's not it's chihuahua so i've been told the pronunciation is um so yeah not the dog but the cheese um frank says have you ever made quark as a transplanter german i miss it even Oh, sorry. When I lived in Canada, I could find it pretty easily, but living in eastern Washington, I've not run across it. Um, yeah, I actually have some quark kits, and I've got a quark recipe. Um, so, yeah, I'll put that on the list of to-dos. It's been asked for a few times now. So, uh, I don't have a video for it. I haven't made it. Uh, the closest I've made is uh, yogurt cheese. 
which is a little bit more tart than what Quark is. But anyway, we'll um, we'll make that in the future and uh, and pop a video up. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Bob, do you sell your cheeses in your shop, or are there laws prohibiting that down under? Um, there are more, not so much laws, it's regulations. Uh, Dairy Australia are the regulator for uh, cheesemakers, and they inspect all facilities, and you've got to jump through hoops. Um, so I don't sell any of the cheeses. I prefer to sell the equipment and supplies to make cheeses. Now, that's totally legal, um, and you can make the cheese in your own home. However, if I was to make cheese and sell it to the public, um, I would be um, down at least $20,000, if not more, to start that just due to regulations and having to build a kitchen from scratch um, all stainless steel, um, proper floors with curved edges, all that sort of gear. Um, I prefer to make it all at home. Uh, good question, though. Thanks, Bob. Um, Sharon says, have you ever heard of using honey um, in any cheese making? I have, and I think I've got a recipe somewhere where you add a little bit of honey obviously makes it sweeter and I think it's after when you add the curds it's not before sorry after you've pulled the curds out of the you've drained it off uh, and you mix a bit of honey for it. I think it's for a sweet cheese I have heard of mixing it with a uh, cream cheese and that sort of stuff Sharon uh, but yeah just do a little bit of research I think you would uh, find some decent recipes I'll have to dig around in all the books I've got um, but that's interesting I've got lots of honey as well Okay, Ron says, um, is it true that vacuum-packed cheeses will taste worse after a few weeks? Um, Ron, certainly not my experience. I vacuum-packed cheeses for, gee, I had a, um, uh, what was it called? Um, Manchego. I had a Manchego and I vacuum-packed it for, 18 months, and it certainly tasted a lot better than when it went in. So um, that was uh, fantastic. Uh, just had a super chat from someone there. Thank you, Frank. Um, no problems at all whatsoever. appreciate it. Okay. Oh, I've missed about 20 questions as well. Um, okay. All right, we're up to GDF. Looks like somebody's bang on the keyboard there. Uh, regarding different breeds of cow, do different breeds produce different flavour compounds that make it into the final cheese, or is it a matter of diet, cultures, and fat content of the milk? Um, a bit of everything there, um, uh, GFD. So the environment that the cow lives in has a big determination on the flavour of the cheese if they use raw milk to make the cheese. If they pasteurise it, all that stuff's out the window and it's just down to cultures and the fat content of the milk, especially if you use standardised milk from different dairies. Um, you'll find a lot of cheeses made in Europe um, are single herd, single dairy cheeses, artisan, very expensive, um, but amazing flavours because they do have the bacteria just from that area um, that's incorporated naturally into the cheeses. So a bit of both, um, but mainly um, the breeds do matter too. But one breed will have a higher fat content one breed of, of um, uh, in the milk and another one will have a lower fat content. Um, like they always say, you should only make uh, mozzarella from buffalo's milk because it's very high fat content. The cow's milk version doesn't really compare. Um, so yeah, certainly different breeds of cows uh, or variation of cows like buffalo's certainly have a, a, um, a have an effect on the cheese. Okay. Um, uh, Degan says, I am trying to figure out Portuguese sheep cheese. Any thoughts? Um, well, the close, closest one I've made to that, um, Degan, is, uh, as I mentioned, Manchego. It's a sheep's milk cheese, but that's from Spain. Uh, close to your, to that neck of the woods. So, it's a fairly simple recipe to try, um, but uh, I haven't seen a recipe for it. Uh, Martin says, hey, Gavin, what are the pros and cons of waxing versus vac packing? Um, all right, so um, pretty good uh, question, Martin. So 
The pros of uh, waxing is that you can reuse it over and over and over again, the wax that is. Uh, you can add the thickness, you know, like you can go from one coat all the way to 10 coats of wax if you want. Um, uh, and as with the vacuum sealing, you can only use the packaging once. However, vacuum packing is so easy to um, to do. <laughs> Two seconds. Um, you pop the cheese in, suck the, all the air out, and then throw it in the cheese cave. Turn it once a week, a lot less fuss. All I do that when I do turn it is um, I tend to do inspect the seal, just make sure that the cheese isn't puffing up, producing too much gas, uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, wax has does ten, has a tendency of cracking over a long period of time. Uh, we're talking a year um, if you're going to make a cheddar, that sort of thing. Um, whereas vacuum packing has the tendency of not being breathable. Uh, like I said, it, if the cheese is producing CO2 or any other gas, the bag tends to puff up and you have to reseal it again. So there's just some pros and cons. Um, look, I do prefer vacuum packing just for convenience. That's the only reason I choose it over waxing. I do like cheeses that are waxed. Um, and the main ones I do wax these days are the cheeses from uh, the washed curd cheeses. So like uh, Gouda, um Edam, um, Havati, those sorts of cheeses. I prefer to wax those. Not for any real preference, but I think the cheeses just kind of taste a little bit better. And they're very soft anyway. So when you vacuum pack them, they tend to squish. So I don't really want that to happen. Anyway. Um, uh, Dagan says, I'm trying to figure out Portuguese cheese. Any thoughts? Um, uh, Sierra da Estrela? Um, no, unfortunately not. I haven't come across those cheeses before. Adam, do you have any advice on how to avoid cross-contamination in a cheese cave or fridge? Most certainly. Um, so what do I do to avoid cross-contamination? is uh, use ripening boxes. So I don't have one with me, but just a red box with a rack in the bottom that's elevated off the bottom of the floor with a lid on it. So if I'm doing multiple types of bloomy rinds, so like I've got a blue in the cheese cave at the moment, um, I've got a, um, and I've got all those other cheeses I mentioned at the start of the show, uh, and I don't want to cross-contaminate, so I've got the blue in the ripening box, um, and uh, that won't cross-contaminate anything, so that's good. So that's my recommendations. Uh, don't put them on a rack in the cheese cave uh, or the cheese fridge, sorry, um, and have like a blue next to a, a, a white mould cheese. Definitely get cross-contamination there. But maturation boxes are the key. I find you don't get any cross-contamination there at all. Okay, um, Jambi says, uh, awesome videos. Looking forward to starting my cheese making odyssey quite soon. Odyssey, that's a great word. Um, I wonder, uh, would you say Emmental is a difficult cheese to make? A scale of one to five. Cheese from Cyprus, the island of Halloumi. Yes, it is. Um, I would say it's about a four. Um, if you've never made any cheese whatsoever before, starting off with uh, Emmental is probably not the right thing to um, start with. Oh. Uh, Kim's bought in a ripening box. That's for the previous question. I'll show that in a sec. Um, but uh, I'd start with something simple, like if you've made halloumi before, I'm oh, sorry, if you haven't made halloumi before, um, make halloumi a uh, great place to start, great cheese, no cultures necessary, um, and give it a go. Um, so, yeah, fantastic cheese, but I wouldn't try Emmental probably until you've got about three or four cheeses under your belt because it is a quite a difficult cheese to get the eyes right with it. Um, and especially if you're in a hot climate, uh, it's more preferable to make it when it's cooler. So there you go. Okay. Ah, oh, Kitty Cats is here all the way from WA. It's a funny time zone. Anyway, good morning. So this is a ripening box, and this is what I use to stop contaminating my cheese. It has a little ray. It's got little feet. I don't know if you can see that there. That's a rack. It's just a steamer sort of box. This is 3.5 litres. So the little rack goes in the bottom. You pop your cheese on top 
and you pop your lid on top. It's like show and tell, isn't it? There we go. And if you want to give it a bit of oxygen, there's a little flippy top thing on the top. I usually prefer to have it closed if I've got bloomy rinds in there. Good for wash rinds as well. Any cheese that has Brevibacterium linens um, in it stops contaminating all the other cheeses in the cheese cave. All righty. So, um, where are we go? Uh, Nose Warmer says, hey, Gavin, what are your thoughts on chocolate milk for cheese? Maybe a chocolate halloumi. Um, unfortunately, the chocolate makes the cheese go bitter. Um, I've uh, often had a chat about it in cheese making forums. And yeah, and the sugar doesn't convert either. It's sweet and bitter at the same time. It's not very good. I have seen cheeses actually coated with co uh, cocoa powder uh, and olive oil to help protect them and add impart a little bit of flavour into the cheese. But chocolate milk just doesn't work because you most of the time it's ultra pasteurised as well, so you won't get a curd anyway. But uh, good try. Thanks, nose warmer. Um, Otis says, how large an area do you need from start to finish? How large of an area? I'm not sure what you're referring to. I think you mean um, in your kitchen, maybe. Um, I, look, I've just got the kitchen sink and the stove and a little bit at the side. That's all I use. Even when I film um, cheese making, you don't need a lot. Um of space as long as you can cook in the kitchen you can make cheese same thing and you may if you're going to age um, semi-hard and hard cheeses you'll need somewhere that is a different temperature than what your normal fridge is okay i'm way behind here i'm terribly sorry um with all the chat questions um uh brock from barcelona says can you use uht milk to make cheese no, you can't. The only cheese you'll get is a very rubbery uh, ricotta. Um, that is the only cheese you can make with UHT milk. Because it's been ultra heat treated, and that's what UHT stands for, uh, all the proteins uh, in the casein of the cheese have been destroyed and no amount of rennet you add will bring that cheese, that milk to life. Uh, unfortunately, it's just coloured water. There is no nutrients in... Uh, well, not many anyway, in UHT milk. Uh, Lactobacillus Prime, greeting from the Netherlands. Um, thanks for doing the lactose-free video a while ago. No problems. Uh, the taste test for that one will be... Uh, we're filming on the 9th uh, of December and the taste test should be up after then sometimes. I'm not sure when. Uh, okay. Kitty Cat says, I'm trying to make a drunken cow cheese. Can I soak the curds in wine before pressing so I get a marbled effect? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, but you make sure that the the curds are still warm because when and, and the wine's a little bit warm too. Uh, because if they're cold, when you go to press them, they won't knit together. Doesn't matter how much pressure you uh, you throw at it, uh, it won't stick together. Um, and only soak for a an hour or so, maybe two hours. That'll be um, all I don't know. I've made a um, a drunken cow before, where I've soaked the the out the rind in in red wine, a dark red wine, um, and it was like two lots of twenty four hours. So I'd I put it in the wine for twenty four hours, took it out, air dried it for twelve, so it dried off a bit, and then put it back in the wine for another twenty four hours, uh, and that gave a nice red rind about what's that a centimetre thick half an inch and that was absolutely fantastic um, but I have seen uh, curds soaked in wine you only do it for a couple of hours because they're very absorbent then too and like I said if the wine is not warm and it hit the same temperature as when it hits the curd you're not going to get them to knit together so hopefully that helps kitty cats Martin says hey Gavin you may recall I asked about infused cannabis cheese a few weeks back uh, well, I've done a cheddar, just that with a cheddar called THC. Oh, how good's that? Uh, let me, I'll let you know how it goes. Martin, that, fabulous. I couldn't do it here because it's not legal, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, fantastic. Yeah, let us know how that tastes and what the effects are. 
Okay, uh, Gadir says, I would like to thank you for all you're doing. Started watching your videos two months ago and already bought all necessary ingredients. I made a do-it-yourself cheese press and cave. Good on you, Gadir. And he's from uh, Azerbaijan or Baku, which is the capital city. Um, thanks again, Frank. I've got to your um, super chat again there. Um, Sean says, uh, do you have to put lipase into cow's milk feta cheese? Um, you don't have to. If you haven't got lipase uh, and you do have um, some goat's milk, do half and half. Uh, you'll get the lipase effect then because goat's milk is sharper. It, it has a sharper flavour. It's naturally got uh, a lot more lipase than what cow's milk does. Cow's milk lipase tends to be quite mild. Goat's um, lipase tends to be a lot stronger. So you can do half and half uh, or just do all, goat, all goat's milk if you've got sheep's milk. The official ratio for feta in Greece anyway is sheep's milk 70% and any other milk, but usually they use 30% goat's milk. So that's the official rate ratio. You don't have to put lipase in it if you don't want to. It won't have that pecan flavour, that sharpness you get with those sort of cheeses, uh, but it'll still make a crumbly feta anyway. Uh, Philip says, any idea what the most profitable cheese is to make? Uh, uh, the cheese that gets the most yield, I suppose, for the milk you've got, uh, and it depends on how much you sell it. I know that one of the most expensive cheeses uh, in the world is real Parmesan, uh, so Parmigiano Reggiano, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, because it's aged so long, that's why it's so expensive. And any artisan cheese that are in small batches, confined to small dairies or small regions, they're going to be the most expensive. Um, if you can find a market for your cheese then, and uh, they're willing to pay a higher price, then the sky's the limit anyway. Um, Adam says, you may or may not be aware the US restrictions on raw milk cheeses makes it difficult difficult to buy good cheeses. How would I go about getting hold of raw milk? Oh, you want to be a criminal. <laughs> um, look, I just approach your local dairy farmer. Um, winking a nod's as good as a, um, uh, as good, good as anything. Go on, go and say hello, make friends with your local dairy farmer. Uh, that's how you're going to get hold of raw milk. That's the only way. And uh, there are dairies that do that. Um, but usually they sell it as pet milk um, for your pets. So, yeah, so that's uh, that's how you get hold of raw milk. Uh, Crust says, a kid threw a lump of cheddar at me. Um, I thought, that's not mature. <laughs> Good joke. Sean says... Oh, I've lost Sean's question. Where are we? Sean says, no. Sorry, Sean. Um, I don't know how to make a cheese cave because I don't have a spare fridge. Uh, I can't use the highest temperature on the fridge. Can I, I can't use. Uh, you can. I, can I use the highest temperature on the fridge? Yeah, look, if you uh, the really stuff in your f kitchen fridge, should be at least four degrees Celsius. Um, what's that, 39 Fahrenheit, roughly? Uh, or otherwise, the food starts to go bad. If you turn the temperature up on your normal fridge, uh, then uh, you're going to spoil all the other food, but the cheese will be fine, right? Um, if you've got a, a place that you've got a cellar that has a constant temperature of, say, what, 13 degrees Celsius around there, and it's fairly humid, use your, use your cellar, not cellar, your basement. If you've got one, um, a cupboard in the house that has a constant temperature, um, if you wax your cheese, then you don't really need to worry too much about the humidity, so, same as if you vacuum pack. Uh, as long as you can keep it at a low temperature somewhere in the house, um, and that'll help. Okay. Um, Bacon says... Um, have you found any cheeses that you haven't made yet that look interesting to make and will you be trying to make them? Um, yeah, you missed the bits at the front of the show. I found quite a few interesting cheeses that I've just videoed. Uh, they'll be out soon, but I've got recipe books that I haven't even read yet and uh, there are so many funky cheeses in there 
from obscure places and names that I can't even pronounce. But I'm still going to try them and I'm still going to mispronounce the names just like I do every other cheese. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I love making cheese and variations on a theme is always a good thing. Once you've got the basic skills down pat, then you don't have any issues. It's, it all seems, well, to me at the moment, and I've been making cheese since 2009 as a home cheese maker, uh, and I think I've got about 130 different types of cheese under my belt. They're variations on a theme now. Once you know the basics behind it, the basic art or science behind cheese making, you can make just about any cheese. I may fail the first time, but failure is all part of learning. Um, so I'll try a second time and see how that goes. Okay. All right. But a great question. Thanks, Bacon. Uh, Martin says, use cheese wax, uh, crisp, mi microcrystalline. Yeah, that's, that's correct. If you use paraffin, it'll crack. If you use beeswax, it, beeswax, it's very expensive, and that tends to dry out as well and cracks. But microcrystalline wax seems to work very well. Okay. Uh, Alex has a question. No, he's talking to um, Sean. Otis, thank you. Um, I think it's Therry. Uh, if I use raw milk, do I have to add calcium chloride? Uh, te technically, no. Uh, but try it without it first. Uh, if you don't get a proper curd set because of conditions of the milk, because dur during the year, the milk changes um, in content uh, of proteins. So I would tend to add calcium chloride. It doesn't hurt the cheese. It's not a bad thing. It's just a liquid salt. Um, but like I said, try it with rennet first. Uh, if you don't get a very firm curd set, add the same amount of calcium chloride as the rennet that you're adding. And uh, that'll sort you out. Okay, Kep says, Gavin, is blue vein cheese supposed to be hard or soft um it is because i tasted a blue from one of our large supermarkets and it was very creamy and tasted great uh kept this um many different types of blue cheese so roquefort which is the traditional sheep's milk cheese from france one of the very first discover discoverers of the mold penicillium roqueforti is a soft cheese um, it's very soft. It's got a lovely creamy paste to it because sheep's milk has a high content of fat. Um, on the other hand, I've seen cheddar style cheeses, harder style cheeses with blue in them and blue veins through them. And they taste fantastic as well. So they're very good. Um, so there are hard blue cheeses and there are soft blue cheeses. So it depends on what you want to make. The salmon cell that I'm making is a hard blue cheese, um, which is going to be very interesting to see whether the veins beside the piercings um, actually make it through to the middle. I've stabbed it a thousand times. You'll see it on the video when it comes out. Um, and uh, the paste is fairly creamy on the inside, but the outside rind's quite hard. Anyway, and I don't think that's going to have a lot of blue on it. Hopefully all the blue will be in the middle. Uh Good question, though, Kev. Thanks, mate. All righty. Um, we're up to... Sean says, no, he has a granny flat, but I do have a spare fridge, but I can't modify it because it's a full-size fridge and still functional. Um, yeah, you can modify it. If you use a external thermostat, um, I think I've got a video somewhere. If you look at my Cheesecake video, you'll see briefly um, the... Uh, external thermostat and it, it's you plug your fridge in you put the probe inside the fridge i just put it over the top and let it hang through the seal and just tied it off to one of the racks and the probe checks what the temperature is inside and it turns the fridge on and off and it maintains around that temperature two or three degrees within that range and you don't have to modify the fridge at all i could then pull if i want to sell that cheese for it that what's a bar fridge under bar fridge what do they call it? a dorm fridge in the u.s um all I'd have to do is give it a good clean out, unplug the external thermostat, and I could sell it. I haven't changed, drilled holes in it or anything like that. External thermostat, go and look it up. Okay, um, Kep, does your recipes produce a creamy or hard blue? Uh, it depends. So the Stilton recipe produces a very creamy, soft uh, blue cheese. The um, Petite Blue 
produces a soft, creamy blue. Um, the In my book, I've also got a farmhouse cheddar blue. That's a harder blue. And this same on cell is going to be a harder blue. So I've got recipes for both kept. Uh, Martin says, hey, Gavin, when I follow your cheddar recipe, I find that after cutting the curds and letting them heal, when I go to stir them, they start to break up a bit. Am I doing something wrong? Uh, sounds like it could be the rennet strength. Uh, also sounds like you might not have waited long enough, maybe. Uh, so the waiting times in the recipes are not arbitrary. You have just you have to check your milk, your rennet conditions. If you don't get a clean break at the time, leave it for another 15 minutes, check again. I've been doing that lately. I think I have to throw my rennet out and get a new batch. Um, so wait 15 minutes, check it again, see if you get a clean break. If that's still not, wait another 15 minutes, check, see if you get a clean break. I've had to wait up to half an hour, sometimes an hour longer than what the recipe that I've cobbled together says it should be. So always check for a clean break before you cut and before you stir. And that first stirring, basically you're lifting. You're lifting the curds up with your spoon. That's what you're doing. You're not vigorously stirring it. They will always break up if you do that. So you're gently lifting them after the healing time and they'll tend to stay together. If they start breaking apart, see if the rennet's not strong enough or you wait, haven't waited long enough. So they're just some tricks and tips. Um, hopefully get you on your way, Martin, and uh, uh, that'll seem to work out a bit better, I hope. Roy says, um, uh, G'day, Kim, Gavin and Kim and fellow curd nerds from sunny Timperley. Timperley, that's nice. I don't know where that is, but hello, Roy. Um, I also says, Gavin, your Leicester video made phenomenal cheese. I put, uh, I put the link, but it must filter out. It does sometimes, unfortunately. I don't think you can put links in chat, except for moderators and admins. But uh, yeah, the Leicester video is absolutely lovely. It makes a fantastic little cheese. Um, and you can add more annatto. I think I mentioned that in the video. Uh, if you want to make a red Leicester, that's the only difference. Don't change the recipe for it. Andrew says, I've seen a couple of your videos, really enjoy them. Thanks for the great stuff. Thanks, Andrew. Question, I've successfully made paneer without rennet and chemicals, only using lemon juice. What other cheeses can be made in this way? Uh, yeah, that's how you make paneer. Well done. Um, you can make uh, ricotta that way. Uh, you can use lemon juice, no problems at all. So that's uh, sweet ricotta. So that's full whole milk. I've got a video on that one as well. Uh, go and check that one out. And you can also make ricotta salata, which is a pressed ricotta. Um, very simple as well. Uh, you can make uh, that no problems at all. So there's a couple of cheeses for you to have a go at. Ricotta salata is a really heavily salted cheese. Uh, and after two to three months of aging, even just in the simple fridge, uh, it will tend to go quite hard, which is... It's a grating cheese uh, without much flavour. Bob says, do you ever go off recipe and just start trying things to see what you get? Yeah, I've done that a few times, Bob. Um, I've cobbled together, say, looked at two, maybe even three books and gone, right, it's for the same cheese, but the recipes are totally different. I go, well, where do I start? So I'll use the temperatures mainly, but the timings and stuff, I'll just throw together and see what happens. And then if the final cheese tastes like, well, its commercial counterpart, then, yeah, I'll uh, I'll call it that cheese or a type or style of cheese. But, yeah, that's what I'll do. Um, and I've made a few recipes myself, um, so that works quite well. Okay, where I'm up to? Have I missed any questions? Probably not. Where I'm up to? Bob. Bob was the last one. Right, Jerry. Uh, Jerry has a question. I have a cellar that I'd like to start making cheese in. What are the ideal temperature and humidity needed to make cheese? Uh, depends on the cheese, of course. If you're into semi-hard cheeses uh, or hard cheeses, then about 13 degrees Celsius or what's that? 55 Fahrenheit is ideal. Great temperature between 10 and 13. Okay, wouldn't go much higher than 13. Uh, around humidity, if you can get it between 80 to 90% humidity, which is fairly steamy, um, then that's perfect temperature for cheese. However, if you're waxing and backpacking, 
the humidity doesn't matter at all. Um, uh, it should be above 50. It couldn't be too dry in the in the basement because um, if you're using wax, the wax will start to crack. Um, hope that helps, Jeremy. Jerry. Uh, Melissa says, I'd like to know if cream cheese is a real cheese. Indeed it is. It is a fantastically real cheese, but not Philadelphia cream cheese. It is processed cheese. So you can make cream cheese very simply. Um, all you have to do is um, get your milk. Uh, you can yeah, you add some starter culture. It's not very much. And it's usually aromatic, uh, mesophilic. Uh, you add that and you add a few drops of rennet and then you leave it for 24 hours. And during that at room temperature, and at that time, it starts to set the curds due mainly due to the lactic, uh, lactic uh, sorry, yeah, the lactic acid um, activity. So all of the lactose is, well, not all of it, most of it, is converted into, the lactose is converted into lactic acid, and therefore it sets the milk. Um, and then basically you scoop that into a um, tight weave cheesecloth, um, and you tie up the four corners, hang it off a big stick or hook or whatever you've got, hang it for about 24 hours and bingo boingo, you've got cream cheese and it tastes bloody amazing. Um, add a little bit of salt to it um, and that brings the flavour out even more. And you can use it as any, like any cream, cream cheese, um, cheesecake, perfect, just rolling in logs, in herbs and spices. Um, fantastic, absolutely amazing. Um, as man says, Saint Agur, I think that's how you say it, is a lovely blue cheese. Yes, it is. Um, Alex says, Gavin, would you consider doing a fan tasting? Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, like having fans who tried your recipes send you their best cheeses and you would judge, judge them or give feedback. Um, sounds interesting, Alex. However, who am I to judge whether your cheese is good or not? If you like it, then your cheese is fantastic. And if all your family and friends like your cheese, they're better judges than what I am. Um, I'm a fairly poor judge of cheese, um, as uh, Kim will tell you about my special marinated feta. I thought it was lovely. They thought it tasted like dog's vomit. So, yeah, maybe it's because I was imp I was partial, but not impartial, the other way, yeah, partial, because I made it and I thought it tasted great. Um Doing a fan tasting where we all get together and try cheeses that we made at some location would be a great idea. Um, but unfortunately, that would exclude everybody outside the Melbourne area um, here in Australia. So that's not really inclusive. But sending cheese through the post is fraught with danger as well, unfortunately. Most of the time, the sniffer dogs get onto it and it gets confiscated by customs if it was sent from overseas. But great idea, Alex. Um, maybe some local ones. We'll see how we go. It's a good idea. Um, I'll even write it down. There we go. All right, Frank says, uh, whilst developing mould on natural rind cheeses, I was under the impression that you dry out the cheese for three to seven days prior to placing it in the fridge. Uh, and then, but after drying and placing in the fridge, rind becomes wet again. Any suggestions? Uh, yeah, drain it longer. Um, so either drain, I think you're talking about mold ripened cheese. Yeah, you are. Ro ro mold ripened cheeses. So if you haven't fully drained them in the hoops themselves, they will stay moist. Um, that initial three to seven days should be on a rack like I showed you. So with the lid off, uh, and all the excess whey will drip through um, so you won't have any trouble. So the say like if I'm making a camembert or even the bloomy goat blue that I made, that was touch dry. It felt like a clammy handshake. That's the kind of touch dry you're looking for. Uh, not dry dry, because it will never be dry dry, like don't no moisture on your fingers. So clammy handshake, that's what I'm looking for when I put any of my cheeses away to develop what it needs to do. Okay, Roy says, Gavin, is there an optimal size diameter to height ratio of made of Stilton in a new mould 
and it's about 12 centimetres by 19 centimetres tall. Not too sure if it looks right. Actually, Stiltons are on the tall side. Um, so they are actually a lot taller than they are wider. Um, so, and so is, what is that cheese? I've got to remember. Oh, no, I can't remember. The French uh, blue cheese that I made that got a bit funky on me. No, can't remember. Um, made so many cheeses. So, yeah, a lot of uh, blue cheeses are taller than they are wider, so don't be too worried about that. As long as it's firm, um, and what they tend to do when they package it and cut it up, they cut it crossways, and you get a wedge of a slice of cheese, blue cheese like that. That's why sometimes when you buy it in the supermarket or wherever you buy your cheese at the at the cheesemonger, you'll have mould on on the sides and the top, but the bottom has been cut. That's because it's a taller, the taller cheese, so don't worry about that. It'll work. Um, okay, Lucas says, are there any cheese recipes using single-strength rennet? I have double sweet organic veggie rennet. Uh, are most, oh, sorry, are most cheeses recipe? Yes, most cheese recipes are using single-strength. All the ones I make are single-strength. Just use half the amount of rennet. Simple as that. Uh, you won't have any trouble at all. Okay, so going down to the bottom of the page, and finally at the bottom, um, Martin says, uh, "Hey Gavin, with regards to the curds breaking, do I get a clean? Uh, I do get a clean break. Let them heal for five minutes. I'll try the lift technique. Yeah, if I've got some uh, some dubious looking curds um, that don't look so nice." Yeah, I'll just lift them to start with, and they don't tend to break apart. Um, but yeah, that's that's um, what I recommend. I haven't had curd break up. The only one, the only cheese that I've made where the curds tended to break up when I did that first lift was, funnily enough, the lactose free cheese that I made. It tend to break, tended to break into smaller pieces as I started that initial stir. Um, so take that at its face value, I suppose. Andy says, uh, what would happen if you tried to use chocolate milk to make cheese? Uh, I think I've already made that one. It won't work. Chocolate will be bitter. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, it just doesn't work. Okay. Uh, we've got my brother asked for me. <laughs> right. I'm sure we will. Righto. Okay. Um, uh, I all... Granny Gavin on Patreon would be a gift that keeps on giving. See ya. Thank you very much, I all appreciate it. Um, Des says, Hi Gavin, what strength IM do you use? And is there a uh, is this a constant in all your recipes? Yes, it is. I use 200 IMCU, um, which is just a little bit less than single strength. Single strength ran it, I think, in the US is 280 IMCU, double strength is 560 IMCU. Um, so I tend to compensate for single strength. I added just a little bit more of my rennet. So use single strength, about 280, between 200 and 280. Um, if you're using 200, add a little bit more for my recipes. Okay, Bob says, send me your cheese. I'll taste a few now. <laughs> you're funny. Oh, that was at Alex. Right, sorry. Um Alex says, thanks for answering my question. Unfortunately, I would not be able to come because I live in Pennsylvania, USA. If you do have a fan meet, uh, make sure to stream it. Yes, we definitely would if we had a fan meet. Um, Frank says, if you do a group taste test of a number of cheeses, it will be great. I appreciate your humility, but it's good to know how other people perceive taste. I think there would be great value in it. Yeah, look, I, I do agree with you, Frank. Um, but I think uh, it may be difficult to pull off, maybe two or even two or three. Like I've been showing in my videos, um, and I had, didn't do it in any of the um, the earlier videos. I've been putting family members um, into the taste tests because just me tasting the cheese. Um, like I said, I'm impartial. I'm, I'm not impartial. I'm partial because I made the cheese, and I'm going to say it tastes great anyway because I made it. I wanted to see what my family members thought of it. That's why for the um, the 
uh, what was it? Uh, one of the washed rind ones that I did recently. Um, I got my dad and my friend David to taste the cheese. And they said it was okay, so that was good. Um, and uh, I got my daughter, Amy, to... She's coming around to do the lactose free taste test, and I think her uh, fiancé is going to be in it as well, so that'll be interesting. I don't know what that cheese is going to taste like. We'll go from there. But, yeah, I've been trying to put a little bit more distance between me and the taste test, if you know what I mean. And it's a great idea, Frank. I won't ramble on anymore. Uh, Caitlin says, what do you recommend for somebody starting out in cheese making? Um, if Kim's quick off the mark, um, there is a video called Beginner's Cheeses Without a Cheese Fridge. Um, so if she puts the link up, that's the best video to go and check out. Um, I go through a whole list of cheeses that are great for beginners. Um, okay, uh, Kim says, don't forget to tell everybody about the lovely phone call from the dairy. Oh, yes. I had this uh, port salut. Thanks, Asman. You're a great man. Um, I had a phone call recently. There's a story for you. Not that phone call. How fortuitous would it be that the telephone actually run, rang when I'm talking about a phone call? Um, Kim will get that. Uh, I had a phone call, not that one behind me, uh, from a dairy the other day, Inglenook Dairy. Uh, I'm having a meet-up with one of the guys there. He rang me out of the blue and said, uh, would you um, would you like to be uh, given their milk uh, for the cheese-making uh, videos? So getting milk for free, it's kind of like a sponsorship, I suppose. Um, but I've been using their milk in the past, so I like their milk anyway, so it's no big deal. So Inglenook Dairy are going to sponsor or provide the milk for um, my cheese videos moving forward. So it'll be pasteurised, unhomogenised milk. Uh, they're a local dairy close to Ballarat, which is a city. We're in between Ballarat and Melbourne, which are two two major sort of cities, Melbourne, the capital of Victoria. But yeah, so that'll be very interesting. Uh, and uh, Kim and I go and have a chat to the people at the dairy on the uh, next Wednesday as well. So that's why we had to um, cancel next Wednesday's show. I'm going to have a quick chitty chat, um, leaving Ben here in charge of the shop, <laughs> which is my 18-year-old son. That'll be fun. All right, so that's what's happening there. So it's going to be good. Um, Ethan says, can you make mozzarella with things like basil in it? Um, seasoning the cheese itself. Unfortunately not. It won't stretch. The curd won't stretch properly. Basil is best with a leaf, basil or a drizzle um, on the cheese after it's made. Um, Ethan says, also, is there an aged cheese you will recommend for my translation from fresh? I don't have a cheesecake currently, but may get a mini fridge soon. Um, try Bel Paese. You can mature it in the fridge. Uh, it's aged for about three weeks. Tastes fantastic. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so that, hopefully that works. Okay, um, Caitlin, thank you, Kim. Kitty Cats, all local milk. I used to live in Ballarat as a kid. Yeah, it's pretty good. Great news, uh, free milk. Yes. All right, I'm going to pat. She's going to pat what? A cow. Uh, Kim has never seen a cow up close and personal. So we're actually going to video the experience. So this this will be fun. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, ask the dairy if you can do a blog from there. Yeah, we're going to. They actually have a tour through the dairy. So we're going to come back another day and do a tour, do a video of the dairy and the actual milk production itself where they take it from the, the herd and take it through their processing plant into the plastic cartons, I suppose, um, and then give it to me to go make cheese. So we're going to do that. We're going to do a vlog um, on that as well. Anyway, I've just realised the time. We're at the top of the hour. So thank you, everybody, so much for all of your questions today. It's been absolutely fantastic. There's still a minute or two to go, so you can do a super chat if you like. Um, no obligation. 
Don't forget that if you want kits and stuff like these fabulous ones here behind, very popular, the mozzarella kit and the fresh Italian and the, the fresh cheese one and even the vegan cheese one, we've been selling some as well. Um, pop over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au and you'll see all the cheese goodies there. Don't forget, I've also got a podcast, which I've been a bit lax with at the moment. These live chats are probably taking the place of those. But I've got like 65 episodes over at uh, littlegreencheese.com. So go and check that out. Lots of recipes, lots of good stuff there. Um, Kim's put the link up for the merch already. Don't forget Patreon. Uh, you can support us monthly and keep the show going. And every little bit helps because of the uh, YouTube ad apocalypse. People keep pulling out their advertising funding all the time. So it's very difficult to make any money on YouTube these days, So um, which we keep the show running. And as I mentioned, no show next week. Um, we're um, concentrating on the business. Christmas is here. We're shipping out lots of cheese goodies as well as soap and bath bombs and candle making stuff uh, for people to make here for Christmas presents. So we're really focusing on that plus a little quick visit to the dairy. Anyway, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds. Appreciate all your time and effort and for all of your wonderful questions. Uh, and don't forget to give the show a thumbs up before I turn it off. That'll be fantastic. Um, see you later, Curd Nerds. Appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Oops, wrong well, button. G'day, Curd Nerds. G'day, Curd Nerds. Well, 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 